Okay, the only announcement I have is that this Saturday morning we will have an open men's prayer breakfast. Everybody is invited, men, women, uh, children, to get a little civics lesson and to become part of the process. We have three uh, speakers who are coming, Lacey Hull, who's running for Texas State Representative in House District 138, which is all this district around us, and then two Harris County-wide offices, uh, Fred Schuchart in the, um, for the uh, 216th State District Court of Appeals, and Mary Nan Huffman for Harris County District Attorney. And all of these elections are important. I get emails continuously from different uh, Christian organizations, a lot of which are encouraging uh, everyone to vote and almost begging pastors to give a, a message or at least talk to people about getting elected. I don't know what pastors do other than fail on their job on a continuous basis. But we try to emphasize the fact that we are to live our lives well and to glorify God in every area of our responsibility. And that means that in the area of our citizenship, we need to be involved as much as we can in understanding the issues and fulfilling our civic duty, which includes uh, voting intelligently. So uh, that's the announcement. Everybody bring your own breakfast. At, we will eat from 7.30 to 12, give an opportunity to visit with and talk to uh, these three people who are running for office. And then we'll come in here and live stream, and they will each speak for about 20 minutes, and that will conclude our Saturday morning, uh, Saturday morning event, and then people can stay around and talk to them for a while uh, afterwards. So that's the only announcement that, that I am aware of. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Before we begin our study this evening, we need to make sure that we are ready to focus on the word and to think through the current issues of our time in light of the eternal word of God. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so each one can make sure they're walking by the Spirit in right relationship with the Lord, and if necessary, confess sin, which simply means to admit or acknowledge our sin to God in silent prayer, and he instantly forgives us of those sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness because we have already trusted in Christ as our Savior. So uh, I will open in prayer after a few moments of silent prayer. Let's pray. Our fathers, we come together this evening to continue to talk about how we should then vote. Father, we recognize that we are at a turning point. We have been for some years, if not a couple of decades, and we will be for a while. No one election turns the ship around, and we need to have believers who will vote and vote according to the Word of God and understand what those issues are. Father, we pray that you'd help us understand those issues in this study and what we're covering tonight in relationship to Israel. But Father, we also pray for our nation. We are told in Scripture that we are to pray for our leaders. And the reason we pray for our leaders according to Scripture is so that we can carry out our spiritual lives in, in peace and in stability because our leaders understand these eternal truths of Scripture and they are recognizing our God-given right of conscience to, to lead our spiritual life according to uh, what we think is right and scriptural. And Father, we pray that we might continue to elect leaders that will uphold that First Amendment right as it was historically defined in, in uh, uh, 200, over 200 years ago, 200 and 
40 years ago. Father, we pray that you would help us, give us the insight into what we're learning about Israel and how that affects current decisions, current policy, current legislation. And we pray that we might always have presidents and a Congress that are truly in their in the depth of their soul, a pro-Israel. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, tonight we're continuing our look at what I have been calling divine institution number six, Israel. And tonight we'll answer the question, why is the U.S. different from every other nation? And that is an important question to ask. Why is the U.S. different? It sort of reminds you of that question they ask at Passover. Why is tonight different from every other night? Why is the United States different from every other country in regard to Israel? And so we need to think about that. And so we have to have both a biblical and a historical perspective in terms of the United States. These divine institutions are the foundations of civilization. Without them, there's a collapse, there's chaos. Go to downtown Portland, go to Seattle, go to Minneapolis, go to uh, Wisconsin, go to some of these other cities that are controlled by Democrats. Now, not all Democrats are totally inane and have lost all sense for law and order. I learned this last week that the Democrat mayor of Houston has done something very smart. He and I believe the chief of police have been going around to these cities that are defunding the police and offering these defunded police jobs. We've got money. We've got a great city and building up the city and offering them jobs to build our police force in that, according to what I've been told, they have done a very good job of maintaining order in this city. And that's why, and that's been historically true uh, in Houston. So when these foundations are there, the righteous can live. The righteous can pursue their walk with the Lord without a fear of assault without fear of retribution from people who are rejecting God and unrighteousness. But when the foundations are destroyed, the righteous are left without government protection. And that's one of the roles of government. So these are the divine institutions. And we've looked at the first three, individual responsibility, marriage, and family. And these were designed before the fall. They're embedded within God's creation, embedded within the makeup of every human being. And they're designed to do something positive, to promote the growth of civilization, productivity, and to advance the civilization from generation to generation as uh, the human race ideally would have fulfilled the creation covenant. But they didn't. There was a sin. As a result, there's the first dispensation from the fall to the flood where there is no restraint on sin. It leads to the increase of evil to where the human race is is close to self-destruction. And so God intervenes, brings the judgment of of the flood. After the flood, he enters into a covenant when he delegates responsibility for judicial authority. Uh, to the human race, and that's the foundation of of government. And then uh, that doesn't work out as well because there's an attempt by Nimrod to counter that with building his own kingdom, his own empire. The father, we might say, well, not the father, but the first human being to promote empire and internationalism. The father, of course, is Satan, who is the father of lies, that we can have peace and prosperity if we just all come together under one government. And so that is the satanic lie. Every empire in history is nothing but a foreshadowing or what biblical theological term is type of the future Antichrist kingdom. He is the first one who will unite the world against God since the Tower of Babel, and it won't end well. And then the fifth divine, or sixth divine institution is Israel. Uh, 
which is God's blessing for all mankind. It will come through Israel. So those who bless Israel will be blessed. doesn't matter whether they're Christian or not, whether they're believers or not. If they bless Israel, they'll be blessed. If they don't bless Israel, they'll be cursed. And, of course, the seed, of the Messiah, which is the Messiah, is going to be the source of worldwide blessing. So that's what we're looking at in terms of these divine institutions. And reminding you that in my definition, uh, this means that these were instituted for every human being, whether they are a believer or an unbeliever. And so even if you have unbelievers that are pro-Israel, God will bless them. And if they are anti-Semitic, God will judge them. We look at the foundation for our view on Israel in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This must be understood in the context. The context is Genesis 11, where the Tower of Babel was built. At the time it was built, everybody shared one language. Uh, there is this international attempt to uh, solidify all of the human race in opposition to God. God comes and divides the uh, human race by language, which is the foundation of tribes and clans and eventually nation states. And then in that context, the next thing we see is the very first mention of the word nation in uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, God has, in verse 1, tells Abram to get out of your country. This is some three or four hundred years after the Tower of Babel. And so there's a recognition that people have their own country, their own fatherland. Patri is the, um, is the Latin word, uh, Greek word also, from which we get the word patri patriotism. And it refers to the loyalty of a community to their homeland, to where they're born, to their country and their nation. And so God tells Abram to get out of his nation. He's going to take him to a new land, uh, make a new nation uh, out of his descendants. And that's the promise in verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be imperative mood. You are to be a blessing. And then the promise in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and curse the, uh, those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. And so this becomes the foundation for understanding God's distinct plan for Israel. Now, when you start talking about Israel, as a Christian, and you are pro-Israel, that, of course, is going to raise a number of questions that some people have. I've heard these questions for much of my adult life. You have, too. You have heard me. You have had other pastors who have talked to you about the importance of Israel and that we need to support Israel. And I remember as a 20-something, as a 30-something, sitting around with other believers after hearing a message on the support of Israel and saying, well, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that we have to agree with every decision, every political decision, every policy of the uh, state of Israel? Does that mean that we have to uh, validate every decision? What if they get in a war? What if they do this? What if they do that? Does supporting Israel mean that we have to support every single decision uh, that's made. And of course, the answer to that is no. There is not a single Israeli or Jew in the world that supports every decision that the Jewish, that the Israeli government makes. Okay? Uh, that's not what it means. But we have to ask that question because it's a very good question. In fact, there have been many decisions that have been made in the history of Israel, in the southern kingdom of Judah, in the northern kingdom of Israel, and before that in the United Kingdom, under Saul, then David, and then Solomon. And there are many of those decisions that were wrong. They were unjust. They were unrighteous. They went into idolatry at times. They rebelled against God at times. God brought his divine judgment on them, took the northern kingdom out in 722 and the southern kingdom out in 586, and then brought them back to the land in roughly 538. 
and then you, but that was just a few, just to establish a, uh, another Jewish state so that the Messiah could come. And so we look at that situation that uh, when we talk about why we support Israel, we have to define its, its limits. One of the reasons we support Israel in, from the Old Testament is in Joel 3, 1 and, 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, and contextually this is talking about the day of the Lord, which is when the Messiah will return at the end of the battle of Armageddon, at the end of what we refer to as the seven-year tribulation period, and he will destroy the armies of the Antichrist, the false prophet. He will throw them into the lake of fire, and he will throw Satan and confine him in, in uh, chains of darkness in the abyss. And then he will establish his 1,000-year kingdom upon the earth. But what happens at the end of the tribulation, before the kingdom is established, there's a series of judgments on the first the Jews who survive the tribulation and then on the Gentiles who survive the tribulation. The Matthew 25 passage that deals with that is often abused and misunderstood and used to support socialism. But its Old Testament counterpart is here in Joel 3, 1 and 2, where God says that at this time he will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There's going to be a judgment that takes place there for the Gentiles. The word there translated nations is Gentiles. Now sometimes this word goy that is translated nations simply means Gentiles. You have to really work with it in each context. And when you have a judgment in scripture, it is never according to class. That was one of Marxism's great errors. That's one of the errors in identity politics is that it rejects the importance of the individual and instead deals with everybody in terms of their group. You are in one of two groups. You are either in the oppressor class or you are in the oppressed class. If you are white, you are an oppressor. It doesn't matter what you believe, what you've done. It doesn't matter how much you lack any molecules in your body that are racist or bigoted. If you are white, you are just as racist as any grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan because that you are in that oppressive class. That is Marxism. That is what Black Lives Matter believes. That is what um, uh, that that is what identity politics is all all about. It is straight from the pit of hell. It is all evil. And what we see is that in all of the judgments of Scripture, individuals are judged according to their decisions and what they do in relation to the God's promise of salvation and in. Uh, and if they reject that, then their eternity in the lake of fire. Uh, and if they uh, reject that, then there are uh, subsequent consequences. One of them has to do with this judgment at the end of the tribulation. It's described as the sheep and the goat judgment at the end of, of uh, Matthew chapter 25, where these Gentiles are brought to the valley of Jehoshaphat and... God says, I will enter into judgment with him there on account of my people. So one of the issues for the unsaved Gentiles who survived the tribulation is how did they treat Israel? It's not the basis for salvation, but it is the basis for whether they get worse judgment or greater judgment. One's worse than the other, sort of a stage uh, four or a stage five judgment. And he says he, the accusation is they have scattered, uh, whom they have scattered among the nations. So the Gentiles are responsible for scattering Jews among the nations, and they have also divided up my land. And so this becomes a, an important issue in, in Scripture. So when we look at Zionism, it is basically the belief that the Jewish people have a right to their own nation, 
in the land that God gave to Abram and promised to him and that he will restore them to as a nation in the millennial kingdom, fulfilling all of his promises, his geopolitical promises of a kingdom uh, to the Jewish people. Now that is not today, that is some time off. So we need to address this question, what does it mean to support Israel and the Jews? How do we do that? Uh, There are a lot of decisions that uh, people, that Israel makes, that we may agree with, we may not agree with. Some of these will be unrighteous decision. Uh, In the Old Testament, the prophets accused Israel of a host of unrighteous actions and unrighteous uh, mental attitudes and rebellion against God, and that was the basis for God's discipline in time. And we have seen that uh, that in Israel, that there were many who are not followers of Yahweh, did not believe in the scriptures, and instead opted for idolatry and living like a pagan. And one of the uh, things that we ought to recognize is that just as in the Old Testament, when God took the Jews out of the land... The principle of, of Genesis 12.3 was still in effect. When God takes the Jews out of the land during the Babylonian captivity, the principle of I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you was still in effect. And the reason I address that is because there is a view that I have heard from Christians that during the church age, Israel is under divine discipline. That is true. But that doesn't give us the right to add to that. And just because Israel is under divine discipline and they are out of the land is no basis for anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. That uh, even when they were disobedient and unsaved in the Old Testament, God still operated as their defender and protected them from those who would seek to destroy them. Esther is part of that story as uh, Haman, who becomes the archetype of all anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist haters. Uh, Haman is uh, hoist on his own petard, as it were, in that in that story. But he has designs on on eliminating and killing all of the Jews that are in Persia. And God works through a young Jewish woman who becomes elevated to be the queen of of, of Persia, and through her appeal to Artaxerxes, he is going to reverse his decision and call for a protection uh, of the Jewish people. So we see how God works, blessing those who bless Israel, cursing those uh, who would curse Israel. And so this is always true. And during the tribulation period, uh, many Jews will accept Jesus as the Messiah, and they will be saved but many others will not. Nevertheless, God is still going to apply the principle of Genesis 12.3 to all of the Jews because it's not conditioned upon their spiritual status, whether they're in disobedience to God or obedience to God. God expects us to always bless the Jewish people. So support for Israel does not mean that you must like or approve or agree with the policies or the actions of the state of Israel or Jewish citizens. You may know people who are Jewish that, that are not very nice, and that doesn't mean that you, um, that you have to support them and agree with everything they do, but you can't let their foolishness lead you to an anti-Semitic idea. And you can't let decisions made by the Israeli government lead you to some sort of anti-Semitic idea. We are to support the Jewish state. We have to address what that means. It doesn't mean that we endorse their political decisions or all of their political decisions. What it does mean is that we have... um, that um, it doesn't, oh, one last thing, it doesn't mean that we affirm their religious or their non religious views. None of those things fit what it means to support Israel. What it means is that we agree 
the Jewish people have a right to their own nation in the land that God gave to Abraham. And that the modern state of Israel has the right to exist. It has the right to defend their borders against all ex, uh, internal enemies or external enemies and to defend internally against the incursions of terrorists. They have a right to establish their own borders. They have a right to build a wall to uh, protect them from terrorists, which is exactly what happened. The number of deaths in Israel uh, due to uh, t terrorists and due to bombings dropped dramatically almost to zero once that wall went up. A wall is extremely effective at protecting those people from their enemies. And so this is what it means to support Israel, support their right to exist, support their, support their right to defend their borders against external enemies and against internal enemies. And as a nation, they have exactly the same rights and privileges as any other nation with no double standard. And that today is a problem because the world holds them to a different standard. Um, so Zionism says that we are to, and, and what the scripture teaches, we are to bless Israel in a way that supports their continued existence as a nation. And we have a current example that I'm taking straight from the headlines, and I want to put it in the context. We have had a president, President Trump, who has been uniquely supportive of Israel since he was elected president in 2016. He followed eight years of the presidency of Barack Obama and Vice President Biden. And during their administration, they set forth this uh, this, it's not a tr official treaty, but it is this agreement to deal with the nuclearization of Iran called the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It's one of the worst agreements the United States ever entered into, and President Obama and Vice President Biden and all of those in their administration a twisted arms of every Democrat senator to vote in favor of that agreement. And all of these Democrat senators who for years had told the Jewish people that they supported Israel all turned their back on Israel because of the, the political blackmail and intimidation that came from the White House. And uh, since uh, Barack Obama no longer is pres president, then uh, President Trump has instituted other policies. And to his credit, he has sought to void that agreement and to enforce all of the sanctions w against Iran that are listed within that agreement. And they have violated that agreement. And so President uh, Trump, just on August the 14th, back in August, went to the uh, Security Council of the United Nations to have them enforce what they call the snapback sanctions, that if Iran wasn't following the agreement, then the further sanctions would go into place. And there really has been a tremendous uh, headlock put on the economy of Iran, and those people are really hurting because of this. And it's all due to their government, not to the United States. And so their government is responsible for all of that. So President Trump went to the Security Council for a vote, and they turned him down. And so they are continuing to press for, um, uh, to extend the embargo on Iran indefinitely. Now, I wonder what President Biden would say about that. Because uh, if he goes lockstep, and he will with all of the others that were in his previous administration, then he doesn't want those to be enforced either. That is the position on the left. They do not want to hold anybody accountable for their immoral and unethical and illegal actions. It is moral permissiveness, otherwise known as antinomianism. Whereas President Trump has been very wise, it seems. There, is a, there came out in the news within the last couple of weeks that Israel has entered into a treaty with both the United Arab Emirates and second with Bahrain. And it has been due to the work of the Trump administration that both of those treaties have come out. Now, if you're not a newsie and if you're not listening to pro-Israel stuff, then you haven't uh, 
a, a clue what's going on because the mainstream media is, is ignoring all of this. And there have only been four or five uh, treaties between Israel and Arab nations over the last uh, 70 years since Israel became a nation in 1948. The, these two agreements are historic. They are more significant almost than any other agreement Israel has made. They are phenomenal. It ought to be front page news every day in every newspaper. But it is being ignored because if people really understood the significance of these treaties, then, then President Trump would be elected in a landslide. And so the uh, Democrat Party and their, um, and their voices, the mainstream media, are not talking about these accomplishments. And what, it com what is happening in all of this that you need to pay attention to is that there's at least seven or eight, let me say nine other Arab countries that are on the verge of, uh, a, of coming to an agreement with Israel as well. One of the things they all have in common is that they are Sunni Muslim countries. And so what President Trump is doing in an absolute stroke of genius is he is putting together a Sunni block of nations allied with Israel, which has the only, only army among them that has been consistently victorious, and they are allied with Israel in order to block the aggressive evil of Erdogan in Turkey and the uh, mullahs in Iran and to shut down the, uh, the aggressive Iranians in their pursuit of nuclear power. And so does that mean it's perfect? No, it doesn't mean it's perfect. Nobody, no ruler, no government is going to make every deal perfect. But that's what's going on here. And even never Trumpers, these are uh, some uh, pundits who were considered conservative up until Trump was elected, and then they just had a hissy fit, and they turned every, really angry against Trump. And e one of them is Brett Stevens, who is an editorialist now for the New York Times, used to be with the Wall Street Journals. He was an editor for Jerusalem Post at one time. And he is Jewish. He's, uh, uh, he's an American Israeli. And he even came out two or three days ago. And uh, honestly, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't resist a couple of jabs at Trump. But he said this was one of the greatest things that that has been accomplished in terms of the Arab-Israeli war. And so even uh, Trump's enemies are recognizing the value of this, but it, you're not going to read about it in uh, most of the mainstream issues. Now, neither Harris or Biden or Biden or Harris, they can't figure out who's on top of the ticket and who's not. They're so confused. Uh, neither of them would have a foreign policy that would ever accomplish this. Because within their framework of thinking, within their worldview, they are not, uh, they're, they not pro-Israel in their gut, in their heart of hearts. They are not. They are total pragmatists, and Israel is just a nation like any other nation. And in fact, within the Obama administration, they were mostly closet anti-Semites, and you know that because they, they would talk out of both sides of their mouth. You have to watch what politicians actually do. You have to look at the bills that they sign to find out what they really believe. Don't pay attention to what they say in their speeches. Uh, you should never vote on the basis of personality. You should never vote on the basis of what, how people act or what you think about them in terms of their appearance. Uh, what you have to do is vote on the basis of principle. And when it comes to this, what we see is that uh, President Trump has been consistent with his pro-Israel policies, working off of that, uh, those, those principles, and he's done incredible things. And the leftists screamed bloody murder when he moved uh, the embassy to Jerusalem, which had been voted on by Congress several times, and every president since Clinton had promised to do it and did not do it, and the international globalists all screamed that it would start a war, and that's exactly what they did uh, three years ago when they moved the embassy to 
uh, to Jerusalem and look at what, what is happening. It didn't lead to a war in the Middle East. In fact, what it's led to is all of these different um, Arab countries are enter, entering into treaties with, uh, with Israel. And this is just a phenomenal accomplishment. This is the kind of thing that we look for in a candidate to determine if they fit the pattern that I've laid out, the biblical pattern and the biblical policies that should be enacted. And um, what we should ask is, where does this idea of being pro-Israel and pro-Jewish come from in the United States? Because if you look at the, the world, other nations do not have that pro-Israel position. And I'm not talking about the fact it doesn't have anything to do with, well, Israel does everything right or Israel does everything wrong. That is not the issue. The issue is these are God's chosen people. God's entered into a covenant with them. And because they are who God says they are, we have to uh, be in support of them and not in opposition to them. And that doesn't mean we're agreeing that everything is right. And if you look at Europe, Europe is historically either anti-Semitic or trending towards anti-Semitism. They have historically been anti-Israel. Uh, they were not uh, willing initially to recognize the state of Israel like the United States was. What makes the difference between Israel, uh, support for Israel and, and anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism has to be understood within the context of the Bible and within the context of history. So what's the New Testament basis for Zionism? We've looked at the Old Testament basis in the Abrahamic covenant, but we should look also at what is said in the New Testament. Now, I'm not going to go through a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Romans 9 through 11, but that is one of the most foundational passages for understanding that God still has a plan for Israel, for ethnic Israel. And in Romans 9, 3, and 4, uh, the Apostle Paul says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. By my brethren, he means ethnic Jews, those that he is related to as a Jew. My countrymen, according to the flesh, makes it very clear who are Israelites. That's the third way he states it, who are Israelites. And then he makes several critical statements. To whom? And in the, in the uh, Greek, it doesn't have a verb. It, it, it's like a machine gun firing quick bullets. He, it's, it's a level of, ex of excitement, and he wants his readers to catch that. They have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. What a pile of blessings that God has given them, and they are presently theirs. They haven't lost any of that. Uh, they have been adopted by God as his people, as his chosen people. They have the glory of that position. They are still God's chosen people and will be throughout all of eternity. And they are the ones through whom the scriptures came. They are the ones through whom the Messiah came. They are the ones who... Uh, who made it possible for the Messiah to come and to go to the cross and die for our sins. Uh, they have the covenants, the covenants of Abraham, uh, which promises a land, uh, a land, a seed, and a blessing. And the land promise is further developed in the real estate promise or land covenant of Deuteronomy chapter 29. And it also speaks to the giving of the law, the Sinaitic covenant. But you have of the covenants, you have the real estate covenant, the land covenant, then you have the uh, seed is developed in the Davidic covenant. And then you have... Um, the blessing which is developed in the new covenant and the sacrifice which is part of the establishment of the new covenant is is the death of Christ. That's what we celebrate in the Lord's table when we take the cup. This, where Jesus said, this is the covenant of my blood. And so this belongs to Israel. All the writers of the New Testament were Jewish. Our Savior is Jewish. There are people who try to deny that, but everything, it, because... It, 
the Jews, it's to the Jews that God gave the responsibility to be the custodians of Scripture, those through whom revelation would come, and they would record it and preserve it. The giving of the law, the Mosaic law, the foundation for the stability in law throughout Western Europe. It comes from the Jews. It doesn't come from the pagan European tribes. It comes from the impact of Judeo-Christianity uh, from the time of the spread of Christianity in the Roman Empire. That's why today everything that is anti-Western civilization, anti-Europe, is that's a cloak. That's a deceptive cloak. It is all about hostility to biblical Christ Christianity, to the Judeo-Christian opposition to personal responsibility, opposition to marriage, opposition to family, opposition to uh, government and uh, the justice of government, the power of taking life, and nationalism. All of that is rejected by modern man. And it is the result of rebellion against God. So Paul establishes that the Israelites are still important to God. They still have all of these blessings. God was not going to forget them. God has not taken away his covenants. And then when you get to Romans 11, 1 and 2, he comes back to this issue and he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he is a genetic ethnic Jew. And he says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God, uh, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. Now, Elijah was wrong when he said that. Because what God says is, I've reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. See, what God is saying is that there are a lot of uh, Israelites at that time who weren't true Israelites. But there are 7,000 in the northern kingdom that were true because they had trusted in God's promise and they had not given in to false religions or idolatry. And uh, this goes back to verse 6 in Romans chapter 9 where Paul said, but it is not the word of God, it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. In other words, genetic ethnic Israel is not going to be the ultimate heirs of the promise, but those who were also not only physical descendants of Abraham, but spiritual descendants of Abraham who trust in the promise of God and are uh, declared righteous. And then at the end, or near the end of Romans 11, we have four verses, 11, 25 to 29, where Paul says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. That's where we are in history, a partial blindness to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so God has this timetable that he's working on. And then he says, and thus... At that point, when the fullness of the Gentiles has been completed, then all Israel will be saved. That is, he will deliver them. This is not a term of justification, salvation, but deliverance from the uh, impending extermination by the armies of the Antichrist. And he quotes then from the Old Testament, uh, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. So God will fulfill his Old Testament promises to Israel. And then in verse 29 we read, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He's not talking about spiritual gifts. He's not talking there about the calling of believers to salvation. He's talking about the call of Abraham and his promises to the Jewish people through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and through uh, David and through the other uh, covenants, the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. Those callings, the gifts, are irrevocable. God is not going to go back on his promise to Israel. And so we have to take, stop at this point and say, what's the implication of that? 
The implication of that is that the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. They are still God's covenant people. And that means that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which is just a cloak, it is a deceptive cloak. People say, oh, I don't hate Jews, I don't hate Israel, but I, I, I just don't think there ought to be a Jewish state. Everything's a problem in the Jewish state. Well, if you study anti-Zionism, everything that the Nazis accused the individual Jews of in, uh, during their regime in the 20s, 30s, and 40s are the same things that today are being accused, that, that Israel is being accused of. So anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and you can't get around it. And uh, this is pure evil. So where did that come from? We have to stop and we have to understand a little bit about the development of anti-Semitism and why as a nation we have to reject that. And to do that, we have to go back in history to the early church, because one of the horrible things, uh, a real blight on Christianity, is that you had the development of Christian anti-Zionism about 200 years after Christ. And so we have to understand something about uh, this timetable. So there on the screen, we have a line from 33, when Jesus was crucified, and then just uh, 50 days later, uh, that is the birth of the church. And for, so the Christianity comes from uh, the day of Pentecost in 33, and then I've taken it up to us today in 20, uh, 2020. And so we have to understand the history. So church history is divided into these three eras, the early church, the medieval church, and the modern church. And we, of course, are in the modern church. And you break down this timeline at the date 1517 when you had the Protestant Reformation. From 33 until 1517, there was only one church called the Catholic Church. Catholic is just a word that means a universal church. Uh, it actually, it split around 1,000 into the Eastern branch, now known as Eastern Orthodoxy, and the Western branch. But they still held to basically the same theological foundations that were erroneous. And, in, uh, and they're influenced by the same movements in the early church. So this is dominated by the Roman Catholic Church, Different people identify the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church at different times. Some will put it a little earlier than 600, some people will put it a little later, but I'm just going to use 600 as the dividing point. And we have to understand that after the Protestant Reformation, it went from one church to many, 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 many denominations. You had a lot of state denominations, such as Swedish Lutheran, German Lutheran, Danish Lutheran, and then when those people came over to the United States, uh, you, they would split. They, would, they split before the Civil War, according to North and South, and then they split over all kinds of doctrinal issues. And so, you, whereas you started with one Lutheran church, Within a hundred years, you had about 50 different Lutheran denominations or Baptist denominations or Presbyterian denominations, and that's what happened. So in terms of the early church, uh, I'm adding a new number there, 150. Sometime around 150 in that early church period, everybody agreed with basically a literal interpretation. There was some allegory. They weren't thinking uh, strictly, they weren't thinking in analytically, uh, but they had a somewhat literal interpretation, whereas they understood the word uh, Israel as referring to ethnic Jews. In fact, it may surprise you that according to demographic uh, studies, that it's, it is uh, postulated that in the year 200, okay, two, roughly almost 200 years after Christ, that Roughly 50% of Christians in the Roman Empire were ethnic Jews. Think about that. 
And when you see how many Jews are saved in the first 30 or 40 years of Christianity and their children would be reared as, uh, as uh, Christians and their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren all reared as, as uh, Christians, and you can understand that. But around 200, you, you started to get this split. But in that early part, Israel was viewed as ethnic Israel. It had such a strong Jewish component in the church that that kept them from uh, going wrong in this area. So Israel meant ethnic Israel in the Bible. The church meant the church in the Bible. And they believed in a future return of the Jewish people to Israel as well as a future kingdom that would be set up when Jesus returned. But by 400, actually it starts around 200 and it becomes uh, institutionalized within the Catholic Church. By 400, you have allegorical interpretation. And that would postulate that there were three different meanings to words in the Bible. There's a literal meaning, there's sort of a figurative meaning, and then there's a spiritual meaning based on the idea you have a physical body, a soul, and a spirit. And all this developed with Origen and was finalized with Augustine. And so under allegorical interpretation, Israel is the church in the Old Testament, and the church is spiritual Israel. And this change it starts to change the church. They, they no longer believe that God has a plan and a purpose uh, for the Jewish people, and that Israel has been permanently replaced by the church. And so this has come to be known as replacement theology, replacing the church. So Israel is no longer important. The Jewish people are no longer important. The Jewish people are no longer God's chosen people. It is the church and everything is about the church and we don't need uh, the Jews. And so this leads to the rise of Christian anti-Semitism. And so by the time you get into the 400s, the church has kicked all the Jews out unless you convert and renounce everything related to Judaism. In the uh, Up through the up through the 100s, you still had a lot of Jewish Christians who would go to synagogue on Saturday and then they would worship with the church on actually Sunday night because most people didn't have Sunday off, they all had to work, and so they would still meet as a church late at night. That's You have the story of Paul in uh, preaching in Acts and Eutychus falls asleep falls out of the window, and uh, he's, the, he's sort of the patron saint of all those who sleep through Bible class. And yet he died, Paul healed him, but this is, it just shows that the church is met at night. So, the, the, you know, there was a lot of interrelationship, interaction between, uh, up through the, the second century, between Jews and Gentiles, but it was getting increasingly hostile. Jewish leaders didn't like it, uh, writers of the Talmud said horrible, horrible, blasphemous things about who Jesus was. A lot of Gentile leaders were beginning to develop these anti-Jewish feelings. And so this eventually leads to the development of a separation and the loss of understanding the Jewish background to the scriptures. Then by the Protestant Reformation, there's a gradual return to a consistent literal interpretation it begins with the 1517, and it goes through the 1500s. In literal interpretation, Israel is once again interpreted as ethnic Israel. So Romans 9 through 11 is talking about a future return uh, of the ethnic Jews to their uh, historic homeland. The church refers to the church. And there's the belief that uh, there will be a future return to Israel. So that takes you through the 1500s. And in the late 1500s, you, st you had a few British theologians who began to understand this and write in terms of the fact that there's a future restoration of the Jews to the land. That is so unacceptable by the anti-Semitic uh, Catholics and Anglicans who have grown up under this system of replacement theology that, that they are either imprisoned or they are burned at the stake. It was kind of funny this morning, uh, that reminds me, we, were, uh, we had the dispensational hermeneutic study group meeting yesterday and today. It was originally supposed to be a conference up, in, uh, up near Philadelphia, 
but because of the COVID crisis, they had to make it a series of Zoom meetings. And so this morning, there was a, a, a fellow who had done a presentation, and they were, they, they had their, unlike the Chafer Conference, they gave a 30-minute presentation and then an hour and 20 minutes of Q&A or something like that. It's, the Q&As are excellent. And it was going pretty well, but they were getting into some things related to the Mosaic Law, and somebody said, well, if, if you take that view, we won't stone you. And somebody else said, no, we're in the church age. We won't stone you. We'll just burn you at the stake. So that's what the British would do. They burned several people at the stake because they wrote commentaries that suggested that God would restore the Jews to their historic homeland. And that sets the stage for the 1600s. Now, I'm going to stop here because I know it's a little early. It's almost 830. But if I go much further, it's, we're not going to be able to finish it tonight. And if we can't finish it tonight, it's not going to be a good breaking point. So we need to just stop here and then work our way through this because this is important for understanding why the United States is different than all of the other nations in terms of their view of the Jews and their views of Israel and the significance of carrying that on. All of these divine institutions that we've been studying are embedded in uh, the, the Declaration of Independence and they're embedded in the Constitution and our founding fathers all understood these from the people that influenced them that were not quoting the Bible like people like John Locke, they all understood these divine institutions. I had an excellent paper given yesterday where the writer went to the first, John Locke's first treatise on government, which is all but ignored today, where he argues for his views from the scripture. And Christopher Cohn gave that and Chris has written several books on dispensationalism and on hermeneutics. And Chris said that, that Locke's handling of scripture was solid. His exegetical methodology and his hermeneutics were sound. And as I read through uh, all of the different quotes and evidence that Chris was presenting, I was looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And I was, what I was seeing was that Locke was firmly committed to what we call the, the divine institutions. And Locke lived when? Locke lived in the middle of, of the 1600s. And this is the period we're getting ready to look at. But you had three uh, great people. I call them the three Johns. You had John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. You had... Um, um, John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, and you have John Locke. And all of these men were, were Puritans, and they grew up in the Puritan households of mid-1600 Britain. And they understood all of these issues, and they're writing on a biblical perspective. And Locke's first treatise on government is a biblical defense of his views. And then the second treatise is the one that is quoted by most people, and that's the one that's based on reason and doesn't talk about Scripture. But Locke was reared in a Puritan home. He has a, uh, a Judeo-Christian worldview, and he never loses that worldview. And he argues for everything from a biblical view in the first treatise. So that was very interesting to see it so laid out in what we would call the uh, four divine institutions. But this is important because it's in the, and what I'll talk about next time, it's in the um, uh, 17th century, in the 1600s, that you have these great constitutional fights in England, hammering out what their constitution is and what their common law is, grounded on uh, the Magna Carta from the 13th century. We'll look at some of that. Uh, to the time frame, but, but the Magna Carta is signed uh, in, the, in the 13th century, and that's when the barons take evil King John and say, you can only reign at, with our permission. The king is not autonomous. The king is under the law. 
and the law is represented by the barons, and that, of course, is the House of Lords. So you're under an authority. You can't, the king can't do whatever the king wants to do. That becomes so foundational that by the beginning of the 1600s, you have the, uh, when Queen Elizabeth died, that James VI of Scotland is the nearest in the line. He becomes James I of England, and he comes bringing uh, his baggage from Scotland, which is the divine right of kings. And his view is the king is the law. The king's view, the king's opinion is the law of the land. And that ran counter to the common law tradition of England. And so it sets up a conflict when he and then his son, Charles I, becomes the king, and they're both insisting on this, and it puts the Christian, the Puritan, in an awkward position. Do I obey the law, or do I obey the king? And so this is what leads to the uh, Puritan war against Charles I, and then it's the establishment of the uh, the uh, protectorate under under Cromwell. There were a lot of things that they did, including regicide, the execution of Charles I, which I do not think was right. But the fundamental principle, the fundamental principle there is that uh, the law takes precedent. The king is under the law, and so that becomes a basis for their the justification uh, of their that. Um, revolt. And it's not really a revolt. It is they are sticking to the law. Then when you get to the 1680s and the uh, protectorate collapses in 1660, Charles II becomes king and then James II. And they're, ju- they're stewards and they're just as bad. And so finally, uh, in a bloodless revolution, the Puritans, uh, our, our parliament, is able to get James to uh, abdicate the throne, and they bring in William of Orange, and it's called the Glorious Revolution. Now, you fast forward to the American War for Independence, and one of the most outspoken political theorists and members of parliament at that time is Edmund Burke. And Edmund Burke firmly believed that all of the reasons and the rationale of of the colonies in separating from the authority of England are grounded in the same arguments that were the foundation for the Glorious Revolution and uh, the Puritan Revolution, which probably shouldn't be called revolutions. They're not overturning law. That's what's common when you talk about... uh, uh, the French Revolution, you talk about the Marx Revolution, talk about the Cultural Revolution, they're overturning everything that was before, they're overturning law, uh, they're, they're bringing chaos and then establishing a totalitarian state. That is not what happened with the Puritans, it's not what happened with the Glorious Revolution, it's not what happened uh, with the American War for Independence, and you get into a lot of different, uh, they, these people really thought through the issues and the scripture, and a lot of their rationales went back to what I talked about earlier, the Magdeburg Confession, and they talked about uh, what the scripture says. And I've read uh, dozens of sermons from the mid-1700s uh, on Ro- Romans 13. They truly wrestled with the meaning of scripture because they wanted to, they did not want to disobey God in the, in the colonies and, do, and commit rebellion against, uh, against a king, something that would be, be unauthorized. So it's in that broad spectrum of history that we see also this development in England of what is called philo-Semitism, from philos, meaning love, the love for the Jewish people as opposed to anti-Semitism. And that develops in this matrix as the Puritan uh, culture of England, starting by the 1840s, completely reverses the the views of, of the British people towards the Jews. And then under Cromwell, the Jews are brought back to the land. And they had been kicked out under, uh, I forget who it was now, um, uh, this, uh, but he, he was one of the earlier Plantagenets or the ones that came right after him, I can't remember right now. But um, 
that's so important to understand this flow of history and to see what's going on here. And this is a civilization. Are they perfect? No. Do they always get the word of God right? Certainly they don't. But their intent is to understand it as clearly as they can so that they can do the right thing in God's eyes. So uh, we'll come back next time and look at how this, this develops because as Samuel Goldman or Shlomo Goldman says in his book, Zeal for Zion, until the late 19th century, that's the late 1800s, most plans for a Jewish entity in Palestine were Christian. The Jews weren't interested in going back to the land, uh, is what he is saying. And later he says that because the Christians got so excited about them going back to the land, this stimulated them to desire to go back to the land. So that's what he is saying is these plans were predicated on the perception that geographical Palestine was the ancient homeland that belonged to the Jews. So we'll start there when we come back next week. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and see the centrality of Israel in your plan, your purposes, in the word of God, and in the thinking of this nation. And Father, we pray that we might continue to have leaders who are not just uh, saying the right things about Israel, but who believe the right things about Israel in their heart of hearts. And we pray that we might uh, have wisdom in discerning the difference. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.